So trial run dress rehearsal before for this fellowship. Namo Tazar Bhagavato Araha Dabusama Sambhutanza. Story of Serima. From hell to heaven to nirvana, truth in beauty, the beauty in truth. The Buddha, re Buddha releases a lady from the sex trade by teaching her the truth. A story about the Buddha preventing the spread of prostitution and the playboy, playgirl ethic and ideal. The Buddha releases a man in training from the hell of obsessive desire love sickness and lust. In doing so, he educates a kingdom. So a core summary. It's a moral story about values, about men and women, about real love, corruption of love, respect in restoring harmony. It's about virtue, about long livelihood, Right, livelihood and right speech and right action, wrong, eightfold path. So the, how, the way that the relationship between the right eightfold path and heaven and the wrong paths and wrong eightfold path of leading to hell and the role of desire. Our role in feeding or resisting the transforming of sexual pleasure into a cash profit trade, porn, flirt, chat, nightlife, brothels. Renouncing the playboy, playgirl ideal. Instead, adopting faithfulness, training in chastity, chaste behavior, self-control. Educating the wealthy, protecting the poor and the vulnerable. When people behave like animals, when men behave like animals, when men behave evilly, like rape, like force, like enslavement, like degrading conduct, called mitya command. Micha Kamezu and Micha Ajiva. Wrong action. Wrong pleasuring. Wrong livelihood. So to encapsulate and get us in a, the right aim, I'd like to take a look at this. This is about CNN hero Anuradha Korala, award winner of 2010. Important that it puts us in the right frame of mind initially. I admire our next hero because of the brave and serious work she does. Every day, this woman confronts the worst of what humanity has to offer. She says, stop, stop selling our girls. By raiding brothels and patrolling the India-Nepal border, she saves girls from being sold into the sex trade where they are repeatedly raped for profit, tortured, and enslaved. Since 1993, she has helped rescue more than 12,000 women and girls. Through her 
organization, Mighty Nepal, she has provided not only a shelter for these girls and young women, but she has created a home, a place for them to heal, to go to school, learn a skill, and for some who are infected with HIV AIDS, a place to spend their days where they're surrounded by love. This is why I admire our hero, Anuradha Karali. So, until we live in a world where everyone knows that real men don't buy girls, we have a hero fighting to free them with every beat of her heart. मलाई चाहिँ पुनामा लगेर बेच्दिनु भएको म त्यतिखेर चाहिँ नौ दस वर्षको थिएँ पहिला सुरुमा जा गएको एक हप्ता पछि चाहिँ चार पाँचजना एकैचोटि पठाएको करेन्टहरू लाइदिन्थ्यो एकदम टोचर गर्थ्यो गर्नै पर्छ भनेर भन्थ्यो एक दिनमा कसैको पच्चिस तिस पैँतिससँग पुर्याउनु पर्ने बाँचे छ त्यस्तो नर्कोबाट फस्नु भन्दा बरु सर्गुमा आएछु कस्तो रमाइलो लाग्यो She went to India. India. No, you don't know who took her. I don't know. Now she is traumatized. She is pregnant also, and she was taken to India, so she doesn't, she cannot say anything. We've seen children who have come back with, you know, broken legs, with HIV positive when they are 14, 13, which is very sad. They are still child, you see. the ball becomes a safe heaven for them it becomes a home their own place where they can now stay work and be happy and enjoy their rest of their life they call me diju that means the elder sister so they have believe on me i i'm very proud of that that the children really believe on me we are doing awareness programs in the villages we go from door to door campaigning is this to manse rakha manse oh you the lip sync longer sir you the utra dile sir ela ta lanu pare bechnu bhanera logera bechi dincha when the trafficker comes he never says i'm going to take your child and make her a prostitute he comes and says there is a big job in the city police are also ding 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 gare sira parare so we have message for everyone So we are trying to educate all of them and say that trafficking is inhuman. Just imagine what would happen if your daughter was standing there and if your daughter was there what would you do? How would you fight? So you have to join hands. You have to take each child as your daughter. वहाँलाई त हामी पुरै जिन्दगी पनि सम्पर्क गरे पनि कहिले पनि के अरे कमी हुँदैन उहाँले धेरै धेरै गर्नुभएको छ मेरो आमा त मलाई जन्म मात्रै दिएको बिजुले चाहिँ आफूले यत्रो गरिदिएको आई वान्ट अ सोसाइटी फ्री अफ ह्युमेन ट्राफिकिङ आई होप आई विल मेक इट ह्यापन वन डे Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to present CNN hero Anuradha Karala.
Namaste. Today, I want to remember all my girls and survivors of trafficking back at Maithi Nepal. I want to thank Vishwa, Bridget and Joe, Nisa. Please close your eyes and take every child as your own daughter. Soon you will feel their sorrow. And then you will feel the strength that comes out of you to protect them. Human trafficking is a crime, heinous crime, a shame to humanity. I ask everyone to join me to create a society free of trafficking. We need to do this for all our daughters. Thank you. Namaste. With that in mind. <clears throat> See this one is decorated body. Kasajita katan bimbam. Basa means to gaze and look at. Chita katan decorated or mind made mind made. Bimbam a body, a pumpkin, a gold or a puppet. See this mind created puppet. A heap of infected wounds, overrated. Arukaya samositan. Arukaya means a heap of sores, of open wounds. Samusitan, elevated, lift raised, overrated. See this once decorated body, a heap of infected wounds, overrated. Now putrid, though it used to attract much attention. Arturam Bahu Sankapan. Arturam means putrid, dead, deceased, or diseased. Bahu Sankapan. Bahu, much, many, sankapang, thought about or given attention to. See this once decorated body, a heap of infected wounds, overrated, it used to attract much attention. In reality, there is nothing there which is either true or dependable. Yasa nati du vantiti. Yasa, which? Nati is not. Duvan, permanent or stable. Dirti, persisting or enduring. See this once decorated body, a heap of infected wounds. It used to attract much attention. In reality, there is nothing there which is either true or dependable. The fairly the synopsis. Now, sometimes these stories involve quite a lot of Pali names. 
people, places, and also things like 31 planes of existence and other Buddhist concepts or meditation concepts. So here is a brief synopsis, a preview, so we do actually make sure that we, we get it. So I'll introduce you to Uttara and the place, Rajagaha, about 523 BCE. Let's meet Uttara's parents. Now, they're rich. They're extremely rich, having given dana to an arahant who had just arise and risen from enlightenment. So they have extremely good uh, resources. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to uh, her husband. And in the locality, we have the Sangha. Now, Uttara has got a problem and she has an idea. She wants to go on retreat and she wants to go on meditation, but her husband's actually nothing to do with Buddhism or meditation and doesn't have any time for it, thinks it's a waste of time. So, <clears throat> she has an idea. Six months into marriage, this is, and uh, her husband just wants to do all of the uh, you know, sexual things all the time. She doesn't have very much time for it and she wants to get into meditation. So, her idea is to borrow some, uh, ask, her, ask her parents for some money so that she can go and spend time with the Sangha. Entertain her husband by getting a professional. And that's her idea, basically. So Uttara's parents do indeed ask, give her 15,000 uh, kahapanas, and that is enough for 15 nights with a local courtesan. Guess who? Sirima. So, sure enough, Sirima comes to the house for her two-week stay, and that allows Uttara to go off and serve the Sangha. Lots of monks come around from the area, coming and going, coming and going, and she does lots of serving, lots of, um, and more and more monks come and go. So this keeps uh, Uttara very, very busy in the kitchens, and as she's as she's doing that, she becomes very sweaty and greasy. And all the time, though, she gets the chance to listen to the enlightened teachings of the Lord Buddha, the Exalted One. And she makes great progress in her practice. Now, the husband sees Uttara with all the hard work and sweat and grease. He pities her and he's smirking. And this infuriates uh, Sirima. And, fear it. and uh, not only that, but she, she resolves to become the lady of the house and feels like she already is. She calls Uttara to her, but Uttara is surrounded by a metta. So the jealous and infuriated uh, Sirima throws uh, boiling oil at Uttara. Uttara is completely unharmed by it, though. It just scales off and she's cool and calm and doesn't get any burn. Her mind is kept clear and calm. They have a talk. And during which, this is very humbling, and Sirima starts to compare her character with the character of Uttara, and she gets down small to size. So Uttara suggests inviting the Buddha so that he can come with his monks. They can offer food, so she demonstrates dana. And this is a great lesson and an opportunity, beyond none, for Sirima. Sirima arrives very, very humbled about the Buddha, and the Buddha teaches her in such a way that she becomes a stream entrant. She renounces her unclean life and resolves to change, including inviting eight monks every day to her house. Sirima has become a stream entrant. She's really pleased about it. And she's also looking forward to offering dana at her house every day to eight monks. And sure enough, her house servants get ready with everything 
she's, she's extremely wealthy of her own uh, means by now. So every day, every morning, the monks arrive. Eight monks and all get served uh, food. So the ha servants are all pretty happy. And uh, Sirima is indeed as well. And then they go back to their respective monasteries. Maybe years went by, we're not told that. Sirima had changed her life. She met and offered to monks every day. She lived nearby the Buddha. He was a devotee and seems to have gone on to Sakadagamin level, if the Anagami account is true. That she becomes an Anagami. Now, meanwhile, back at the temple, nine miles away. Unmindful monks who have been eating at Sirima's house are arriving back. And they talk about her beauty and her delicious food. Now, one monk nearby, in bed, overhears these conversations. And this, for him, is really inflaming. He falls immediately in love with the idea of Sirima without even so much as seeing her or hearing her. So much so that he makes a strong resolution and follows his fantasy world to go to her house. So, as per usual, the, monk, the uh, household, household housekeepers are preparing. It happens to be on that day, though, that he chooses to go. Sirima is extremely ill and sick and feverish, probably something like cholera, typhoid, or plague, something like this. So he, <clears throat> she can't even get out of bed. So the monks arrive, and our passionate monk and deluded wrong view monk is, uh, is there as well. And he is on fire with passion and fantasy. And can't stop dreaming and thinking and imagining about her. So Sirima is helped to the, uh, come where the monks are by her servants because she can't even walk. She's shaking. And she pays her respects to the, uh, to the Sangha and then uh, go, goes off. Now the monk is so uh, overcome, he can't even look at the food that the servants have brought them. He's that uh, obsessed and that delirious. He, he can't even look at food. He's uh, so hot, so tormented and craving with deep attachment. Next, I think we, I want to introduce these ideas before they come up in the story so that people are very, very, very clear. So our story takes place on the human plane. Underneath the human plane, we have the animal plane, hungry spirits plane, demonic plane, the hell plane. Now our lusty monk, therefore, with his craving and obsessions, is temporarily reborn and psych mentally reborn in the hungry spirits plane, demonic plane, and the hell plane, just through all of his endless craving. Four days he spends in bed, um, <clears throat> not even able to touch food, just because of desire. But the teaching at the cemetery that comes later on means it becomes a stream entrant. So he, he won't be able to get reborn in those four planes again. So this is a very important point. Something else that we want to take on is about uh, Sirima's rebirth, because she actually dies. <coughs> <coughs> from, the, from the human plane, someone who has become stream entrant or the next level gets reborn up here, somewhere Yama, Deva Kingdom, Tusita, or Nimanarati. And we are told in one account that uh, she is reborn in the Yama Deva Kingdom. And in another account, so that one's by Buddha Gosa, and in the other account, um, that she is born in the Nimanarati 
Deva, uh, Deva realm at that point, but not for very long because the body uh, only spends four days there. So she comes down from uh, and listens to the Buddha's teachings. And while she's listening there, she actually becomes an anagami. So in order to show where she gets reborn, we have to show you much more of the diagram because it's a long way up. First jhana, we'll get you into the second the retinue of Brahma, ministers of Brahma, great Brahmas. Second jhana, devas of limited radiance, devas of unbounded radiance, streaming radiance. Third jhana, limited glory, unbounded glory, <coughs> shining bright glory, very fruitful devas and the no sanya beings. The realm above this is where our anagamis are reborn. Anagamis are reborn in what we call the pure abodes because their minds become very pure and don't fall away from it. The devas that don't fall away and they're untroubled, they're contented, they're not troubled by lust and etc. And the beautiful devas, the clear-sighted devas, and right at the top there the peerless devas. So in brief, she gets a very high level after all this, from being a prostitute up to nearly an arahant, in fact. Now another um, model that is used is the model of the four stages of enlightenment. I want to expand on those just before we assume that everybody understands them and make them uh, discuss them a little bit. The first level, after having attained insight and re releasing the views, Sotapanna. The second one, Sakadagami, once returner, and non returner, Anagami. So that's his uh, And the one above that, the Arahata path. Arahant. Okay, so let's look at those in English. Uh, stream mentor or stream winner, once returner, non returner, and fully awakened. Let's have a look what that means. Anagami does not return the person who has attained the third path, this is where she gets to, has eradicated, uh, has, a, has eradicated all forms of sensuous clinging but still clings to birth. And in Buddhism, an anagami is a partially enlightened person who has cut off the first five chains that bind the ordinary mind. Anagamis are not reborn into the human world after death, but into the heaven of the pure abodes where only anagamis live. There they attain full enlightenment. The Pali terms for the chains which an, of which an anagami is free are belief in eternal soul and self, attachment to rites and rituals, skeptical doubt, then also sensuous craving and ill will. So those five. The five that they're not yet free from are craving for fine material existence, like jhanic pleasure, craving for immaterial existence, the higher four jhanas, the immaterial ones. They still have some conceit, they still have some restlessness, and they still have some ignorance. At the end of the discourse, the young bhikkhu had released all desire, seen the Dhamma path, and attained sotapati fruition, becoming a stream entrant. Now the first level, stream entrance reaches arahantship within seven rebirths upon opening the eye of the Dhamma. Stream entrance has attained samaditi, right view, has complete confidence or sadha in the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, has removed the sankharas that force rebirth in lower planes. That individual will not be reborn in any plane lower than the human, animal, pet or in hell. And a little note on that, if we break our story is basically set on the human realm plane. But if we <clears throat> take a look at the seven realms that are the basic Devo ones, below Anagami, and below that there are the four realms. Those are broken into the four suffering realms, Apaya, Bhumi, and then the seven realms above. Mahasi Sayadaw once has written that if we attain Nirvana one time, clarify the views much, we will not be reborn in such a confusion of 
the four lower realms, we can have access to the seven lives, boons above that. And we can be reborn quite a lot of times in any of those seven. Just to clarify that, because many people just think it's seven lives, like seven vehicles, seven cars up ahead and then no more. It's not necessarily quite like that, according to that writing by the uh, Venerable Asi So Dhammapada147, the story of Sirima. <clears throat> so we're setting this in, it's in Rajagaha, about 523 BCE. While residing at the Jayatavana Monastery, the Buddha uttered verse 147 of this book with reference to a lady called Sirima. Sirima was previously a highly valued escort lady, a prostitute, a courtesan. the world of paid-for sex, of sensual indulgence by those with too much money, destined for rebirths in an animal realm, hungry ghost realm, asura, or a hell realm. Highly accomplished and skilled in singing and dancing, an attendant of nobles, endowed with good fortune, Wealthy men would pay 1,000 kahapanas for one night with her in bed. So 1,000 kahapanas, a rough guide. We are told that eight meals for eight monks cost 16 kahapanas. So one meal equals two kahapanas. And bedok, a plain meal at a restaurant is about $4 or $5 Singapore. That means two kahapanas. So one kahapana is about two dollars fifty Singapore. So one night in bed with Sirima is approximately two thousand five hundred Sing dollars. <clears throat> so her journey of transformation of mind began while a courtesan and took her to stream entrant and then up to all the way up to Anagami according to the Vimanavatu from where attainment of Arahantship can be reached. Sirima had been born as the daughter of a famous, beautiful courtesan. Her name was Salabati. Sirima's mother was a prostitute, escort for upper-class, wealthy men. Sirima was thus raised to be a courtesan. During her work, Sirima was later converted to a good way of life and changed her mindset, her values and livelihood. This transformation happened after she conversed with the Buddha who taught her at the house of a lady called Uttara. At the time of that teaching, Sirima had become a stream entrant. 
The two ladies had had an encounter whereby Uchua had been extremely pious, kind, forgiving, tolerant, and pure. During this encounter, Siri Ma had attacked Uchua using a ladle full of boiling oil from the kitchen. Utara was protected from this attack by the power of her loving kindness and unharmed. On a, upon advice, Sirima requested the Buddha's forgiveness. This teaching caused her stream entry. And thereafter, Sirima offered alms food to eight bhikkhus daily. One of these bhikkhus, when visiting a monastery nine miles away, happened to mention to other bhikkhus how beautiful Sirima was, and also that she offered very deli delicious food to the bhikkhus every day. On hearing this, one young bhikkhu instantly fell in love with Sirima, even without seeing her. The bhikkhu was desperate to see her. Thus he walked all through the night in order to get in line and be among the group of eight bhikkhus invited. The next morning at dawn, the young bhikkhu went with the other bhikkhus to the house of Sirima. Sirima was not well on that day. She had a fierce fever. But since she wanted to pay respects to the bhikkhus, she was carried by her housemaids from her resting quarters. Sirima was feverish, pale, sweating, weak and shaking. The young bhikkhu, seeing Sirima, thought to himself, Wow, look! Even though she is sick, she's still amazingly beautiful. And he felt a very strong, passionate desire for her, oblivious, ignoring and inconsiderate of her painful and distressed condition. Even though the, mood, the food was so fine and luxurious, when the meal was offered, the monk could not even look at it. So lovesick was he over the lady. Afterwards, he wandered, dazed, back to the monastery, racked with the pain of longing, the food still in his bowl. He was totally lovesick. He lost all interest in food as it gradually went mouldy in his bowl. He lay in bed with great emotional pain and misery and torment. But unknown to the monk, that very night, Sirima went into high fever. Sirima died. Her physical material body, her inner organs, they expired 
and fever. But her mind, her mind stream, was thus propelled onwards. Sirima died a good virtuous person, charitable, upholding Dhamma and the Sangha honorably. She was said to be reborn in either the Yama kingdom or higher up in Nimanarati Deva realm. Yama kingdom is said to be a realm in between Tavatingsa Deva realm and Tusita Deva realm. She was said to be reborn as the wife of Yama King of the King of Yama Kingdom. His name is Suyama. About Nimanarati, the fifth of the six Deva worlds, so called because they delight in their own creation. They can create any form, in any colour. King Bimbisara, knowing Sirima was a Buddhist lay devotee, went to the Buddha and reported to him that Sirima had died. The Buddha requested of King Bimbisara, that instead of immediately cremating the body, that lay out, they lay out the lifeless corpse at the cemetery. keep it there for three days without burying it, but to have it protected from crows, stray dogs, hyenas and vultures. The king did as the Buddha requested, trusting in the Buddha's insight. In India, there is fierce heat, and a body soon decays much faster than any, in other places. And on the fourth hot, sunny day, the dead body of the beautiful Sirima was no longer beautiful and no longer desirable. Decaying and rotting and breaking up. The skin got dark brown and bloated. Worms and maggots came out from the nine orifices. Flies hovered and buzzed around. Foul smells spread. On that day, the Buddha took his bhikkhus to the cemetery to observe the body of Sirima. The king also came with his men. He had seen how obsessed the wealthy had been over her beauty in her days as a courtesan. The young bhikkhu, who was so desperately in love with Sirima, did not know that Sirima had died. When he learnt 
that the Buddha and the bhikkhus were going to see Sirima, he eagerly joined them. At the cemetery, and the corpse of Sirima was surrounded by the bhikkhus headed by the Buddha. And a great many buzzing flies. Also, arriving from the sky above the cemetery atoll was the not visible deva reborn form of Sirima who had made the journey to attend and listen to this teaching of the Buddha. And she was accompanied by 500 celestial vehicles in tow. It's important is to bear in mind that Sirima had such a great respect for the wisdom of the Buddha. Sirima would have been delighted to witness this use of her previous corpse as a teaching tool and probably highly amused. Bear in mind that it's also important to reflect that Sirima would almost certainly have had a kind of contempt for the ways of prostitution and that lustful side of the male mind. Therefore, she would have been delighted that the Buddha was educating those wealthy men and all others, including monastic males. Sirima may have had by then a relatively low opinion of those who delight in excessive sensual indulgence and consider the female physical form merely as an object of sexual sense gratification. So Sirima was actually present at this teaching, suspended in the air, not visible to most people. She attended the discourse and cremation. She arrived with a group of celestial vehicles and a large group of devas from her new realm. The presence of the divine vehicles and the large group of devas was only visible to those who had developed extrasensory perception, the clairvoyant sixth sense of divine eye. Venerable Vangisa was one such monk. With the Buddha's permission, Vangisa asked the deva at the head of their retinue to please identify herself. So the deva did, saying that I was formerly Sirima, explaining that now she had been psychically reborn into the higher deva realm. The Buddha then asked the king to get a town crier to beat a drum throughout the city, making an announcement. The town crier banged the drum and then cried out loudly to the assembled crowd.
Sirimars, now rotting maggoty body, three days a corpse, left out in the heat, will be available on a payment of 1,000 in cash per night. But no one would take them for the price of 1,000 garpeners. They were all silent, looking away. Again, they're trying. So the drum was beaten and the bidding was lowered to 500. No one said hem or hum. People made faces at the thought of that body. For 250, the crowd were silent. Eventually, the price went right down to a one half kahapana. Silence. Or even if she were to be given free of charge, and still no one stepped forward. No one wanted to take home the stinking, blackened, and bloated corpse. They were all silent, mouths downturned. Returning to the crematorium, the town crier brought the report that not one person would take the rotting corpse, even for free. Then the Buddha said to the audience, Bhikkhus, look at the now rotting corpse that was Sirima. When she was living, there were many who were willing to give 1,000 kahapanas to spend one night with her. But now, none would take her, even if given without any payment. The body of a person is subject to deterioration and decay. At this point, 
as a result of listening and watching the spectacle that now Deva, formerly Sirima, became an Anagami. great many other people of the community assembled were benefited by this valuable teaching, renouncing their previous habits and bad ways. The body was then cremated. Yeah. So let's see the verse within its context, among the verses before and after. Why is there laughter? Why jollity when the world is on fire? Since you are clouded in darkness, should you not seek the light? Gaze upon this uh, once decorated body, it used to attract attention. But now it's only festering flesh, a putrid thing. It's neither sure nor substantial. This body wears out with age. It becomes a host of diseases, vulnerable, fragile. It's a decrepit, disintegrating mass which eventually ends in death. What pleasure does life hold once one has seen old bleached bones, discarded and scattered around? The physical body consists of bones covered with flesh and blood. Stored up inside it are decay and death, pride and malice, passed down by the wise is the knowledge that though what is externally impressive loses its, loses its splendor and though our bodies will decay, the truth itself outlasts all degeneration, while aging fools put on weight like oxen in their stalls, their minds remain small. For many lives I have wandered looking for but not finding the house builder who caused my suffering, but now you are seen and you shall build no more. Your rafters are dislodged and the ridge pole is broken. All craving is ended. My heart is as one with the unmade. Those who, while still young, neither choose a life of renunciation nor earn a good living end up like dejected old herons beside a pond without fish. Those who, while still young, neither choose a life of renunciation nor earn a good living while will end up bemoaning the past for falling like spent arrows that have missed their mark. The Dhamma lessons emphasized here are from the 40 Samatha meditations. Bright light uh, in order to attain the Deva realm. All the corpses including the bones are then there. Buddha, Buddha Dharma, but not so much Sangha. Sila, Chaga, Devas, Kaya, Marana, and Nibbana, and Metta, and food. It just leaves seven, eighteen that aren't really covered. So it's a lot. So all of the ten objects of repulsion are there. A suba sanya to cultivate the perception of the impure, the nasty, the unpleasant. Anicca to cultivate the perception of impermanence. Dukkha cultivating the perception of suffering, illness, decay and aging and relative to, to beauty, for example. Anatta sanya to cultivate the perception of there being no eternal entity. Marana sati, cultivate the perception of the reality of death. Ahara particular sanya, the dispassion to food. Another topic that is covered is attraction, subduing the attraction to the opposite gender. In the Sangnita Nikaya we are described five powers that are attraction of opposite genders, though expressed as powers of women, Matugama. It applies to both genders. Though these five begin with Rupa Vajachahoti, beautiful form or handsomeness. Secondly, Bogawa, 
the resources, assets, or family connections, or wealth they may have. Silua, their precepts, and do they harmonize with the monks and nuns and temples? Dako Jehoti Analaso, their capacity for hard work, skill in crafts, arts and sciences. Ability of reproduction and family making. Next, in the Book of Fours, there is a wise formula that helps us decide on activities. Tana Sutta, courses of action. It categorizes activities into four kinds, They're in terms of either pleasure or benefit. The first type are not pleasurable and not beneficial. Second type are pleasurable but not beneficial. Third type are not pleasurable but beneficial. Fourth type are both pleasurable and beneficial. Monks, there are these four courses of action which fall. There is the course of action that is unpleasant to do, but when done leads to what is unprofitable. There is the course of action that is pleasant to do, but when done leads to what is unprofitable. There is the course of action that is unpleasant to do, but when done leads to what is profitable. And there is the course of action that is pleasant to do, and that when done leads to what is profitable. I prefer to use the word beneficial. Let's have a look. Not pleasurable, not beneficial. Pleasurable, but not beneficial. Not pleasurable, but beneficial, profitable if you like. Pleasurable and beneficial. And that's the end of the talk. One minute from two.